Around 150 years after the death of Hatshepsut, my next woman used diplomatic skills to assert herself at the heart of Egyptian politics. Her name was Nefertari. Meaning the loveliest one of all, Nefertari was not only beautiful, she was also one of Egypt's most gifted queen consorts. As a very young woman, Nefertari had married a prince who would become one of Egypt's most famous pharaohs, Ramses II. And it's quite impossible to go anywhere in Egypt without bumping into him. For he ruled longer, built bigger, and certainly boasted more than almost any other pharaoh. In ancient Egypt, size is everything. And Ramses himself has accurately been described as the giant planet Jupiter. Brilliant at a distance, but essentially a ball of gas. And this really cuts to the heart of his policy of quantity over quality. The bigger, the better. And this is wonderfully expressed by this statue here. We can see Ramses on a colossal scale, while even his favourite wife, Nefertari, clutches at the back of his leg, not even as high as his knee. So in order to find out more about her, we have to travel beyond Egypt's traditional boundaries. So I'm going 400 kilometers south to tell a different side of this story, to the temple of Abu Simbel. As one of the most monumental examples of pharaonic might, it was built on the border with volatile Nubia and was designed to strike fear and respect into all who sailed past along the Nile toward Egypt. This is the temple of Abu Simbel, built by Ramses II during his 67 year reign. And it's typical of the man. It's massive. It's monumental. And yet it's only one of the temples at Abu Simbel. In short, it's only half the story. The story I'm really interested in is next door within a temple dedicated, for once, not to Ramses, but to his wife. Here she is, the great queen Nefertari, standing a colossal 33 feet tall. And if you look very carefully, you'll see she's just that little bit taller than her famous husband, Ramses II, because of the tall feather crown she's wearing. Built to make a statement, the temple's towering size conveyed a strategic political message that puts Nefertari at the heart of power. And so for Ramses to erect these massive statues of his wife, he's really bringing into play every force at his disposal, including the, uh, the, the good lady wife, um, the little woman at home, quite literally, but out here in Nubia, in the wilds of this desert landscape, these volatile tribespeople, he needed her help, and she was a very potent force. Her colossal striking image reveals that Nefertari was the ultimate trophy wife. Shukran. 
In the interior of her temple, Nefertari appears in a variety of scenes, performing a series of sacred rites, taking an active role next to her husband. She's got her arms raised. She's encouraging her royal husband, Ramses, who's in that classic pose of an Egyptian pharaoh, smiting the enemy. Basically, this is a state execution. They cower at his feet. He holds them by the top of the head with the hair. And once they're in that position, he brings the weapon down on their head, literally bashes out their brains. And all the while, Nefertari on the sidelines is a kind of royal cheerleader, if you like. Two sides of the same coin, but of no less value than a husband. It's a very, very potent scene. There is definitely no doubt that this was a royal double act. Egyptologist and Abu Simbel director, Dr. Ahmed Saleh, has spent many years studying the images within both these temples. Is there enough information in the evidence we have to try and get an understanding of what they were like as a couple? He loves her very much. He married her before he ascended to the throne. That means he had fallen in love uh, with Nefertari. She accompanied him like a deputy. Yet it seems that when Nefertari sailed this far south, her health was fading fast. The sad story here is Nefertari didn't see her temple. She was sick. Uh, she is staying in the boat. Maybe she can see uh, the statues of her yes. outside, but she didn't uh, come to inside her temple. What a shame she could only view the yeah. exterior. At yeah. least she saw her statues. This is a sad story. I, it I, is a sad story. Yeah, I think this is the last time of, uh, of Nefertari. This is, we are talking about the 24th uh, uh, year of his reign. This is the last year of Nefertari because when she go back to Sibs, I think she died and she buried there. I'm travelling back north to get inside Nefertari's tomb, the place where I can find more evidence of the woman herself. Located in the Valley of the Queens, its scenes are so delicate that access is limited. I've just been given permission to personally unlock the tomb of Nefertari, the great royal wife of Ramses II, and I'm really excited because this is an absolute gem of a tomb. I've only ever seen it once before when I was much younger, so this is going to be a rare treat. That is a big key. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Covering 520 square metres, its brilliant, jewel-like images vividly depict her journey into the hereafter. The scenes just continue one after another after another. There's nothing here left to chance. Nothing's thrown in simply as a little bit of pretty decoration. It's like a machine functioning to keep Nefertari's soul alive in the next world. Great attention was given to her appearance. Her eyes and eyebrows outlined in black, a subtle red colour on her cheeks and lips, and the most exquisite golden jewellery adorning her, Nefertari the loveliest of all. Her name implies incredible beauty, and she really lives up to this, this name that she has. She's the ultimate high-maintenance woman. She was certainly beautiful, but one particular wall scene shows Nefertari in the company of Thoth, 
the god of knowledge and literacy, who was selected for a reason. We come to this wonderful scene which really ties in to what we know about Nefertari in life. Nefertari's chosen to have the weighing of the heart, the judgment of the dead scene from the Book of the Dead, written out, but illustrated in a rather unique manner because she a hitch, here she is. She's having herself in the guise um, of a devotee of Thoth, the ibis-headed god of literacy and writing. And the emphasis on writing can be seen on the scribal palette which stands between Nefertari and the god Thoth. And there she's presenting herself before Thoth. She says, I am a scribe. I am a scribe. That's quite an emphatic statement. Not only beautiful, this woman was pretty clever too. As a royal wife, she would of course have had scribes to write on her behalf. But being able to read and write hieroglyphs was then regarded as the ultimate in academic achievement. And Nefertari made sure that her credentials would be clearly portrayed for posterity. Being the wife of such a domineering husband would also have required a considerable amount of gentle persuasion and soft power. Skills best shown in diplomatic correspondence exchanged with Egypt's great rivals, the Hittites of Anatolia in modern Turkey. Nefertari is known to have corresponded with her opposite number in the Hittite heartland, the great queen, Pudahipa. And it's amazing that one of these very letters has actually survived. Nefertari would have composed her own letter um, in the Egyptian language, and then uh, a bilingual scribe would have translated it into cuneiform and then embossed it on small clay tablets. This is the exact letter that Nefertari wrote to Pudahipa. It's obviously a replica, but it really gives a flavor of the very words of our great royal wife, Nefertari. It's full of warmth, full of sisterly felicitations. To my sister, Pudahipa, great queen of the Hittites. May the sun god of Egypt and the storm god of the Hittites bring you joy. And may the sun god make the peace good forever. And at the very end is this very touching reference to the greeting gifts she's sending the Hittite queen. I've sent you a greeting gift, my sister. For your neck, a necklace of pure gold and some colored linen to make a royal robe for your husband, the king. Sending such greeting gifts to the monarchs with whom you corresponded played a crucial role in the diplomacy of the ancient world. If we actually look at Nefertari's ear, we can see something which encapsulates this idea. Because regardless of all the gold, all Egyptian royals were dripping in gold. Everybody knew that gold was as common as dust in Egypt. You only have to pick it up, wrote the ancient correspondence. But in Nefertari's ear is a silver earring, a far more value. Not only that, it isn't even an Egyptian earring. It's a style of Greek earring because these silver uh, pieces of jewellery were sent to Nefertari from the Aegean area. So in faraway Greece, they knew about Nefertari and these earrings were sent to her and she wore them with great pride throughout her life. So there's rather more to this uh, jewellery and frocks business than at first meets the eye. Amidst such jewel splendour, Nefertari was finally laid to rest in the manner in which she had lived, in the most spectacular tomb in the whole of Egypt. I think one of the things that strikes you most emphatically when you catch your breath and calm down and start looking at these things in a more logical rather than an emotional way, you suddenly realise that Nefertari's husband's not here. The great Ramses, 
is nowhere present. He's on every temple throughout Egypt. He's everywhere. And yet here, in his wife's last resting place, there isn't a single image of him. Now, of course, Egyptologists have postulated many theories about why the great Ramses wasn't actually portrayed in his wife's tomb. I personally prefer to think that she herself thought, well, I've lived with him for so many years and in the next world it'd be wonderful not to have to listen to him forever. But whatever the real reason, there's no doubting the importance and influence of Nefertari as queen of one of Egypt's best known pharaohs. Yet despite Nefertari's best diplomatic efforts, Egypt's political fortunes were soon in sharp decline. Amidst rampant inflation and official corruption, a long series of ephemeral rulers proved completely incapable of defending Egypt's borders from wave after wave of foreign invaders throughout the first millennium BC. And the most successful of these were the Macedonian Ptolemies, who would change Egypt's fortunes forever.